Hi, this is Susan Wingrove Reed. I'm the principal keyboard player for the Anchorage Symphony and the education consultant. And I would like to spend a few minutes talking with you about the program for the grand finale concert of the Anchorage Symphony season, which I just can't believe this is coming up. And we've had an entire year of in-person playing together and having a live audience plus a live stream audience. So thank you for your continued support of the orchestra and your interest in what we're doing and what we're sharing. So this really amazing program is coming up. And the first piece on the concert is by Lily Boulanger. And she is little known, but deserves to be very well known. And we're really happy that Elizabeth chose this piece to begin the concert. Music lovers look back in history and wonder about the composers who wrote masterpieces and died young. Schubert was 31, Mozart was 35, Mendelssohn was 38, and there are others. And they left a significant body of work that secured their legacies. But what about composers that were cut off even earlier? Amazing talents who left a single masterpiece or a few masterpieces and are remembered for what might have been also. At the top of that regret list is Lily Boulanger. She died in 1918 at the age of 24, and she was well on the path to become one of the most notable French composers in the 20th century. She was the younger sister of Nadia, who was a prominent organist, conductor, and teacher. And she taught a who's who of an American composers like Aaron Copland and Virgil Thompson. They had a musical dad and mother, and the composer Gabriel Faré was a friend and a guest in their home a lot and recognized that Lily, the younger sister, had perfect pitch at the age of two. The tiny girl got a really bad case of bronchial pneumonia and was frail for the rest of her short life and developed what we now call Crohn's disease, which causes constant fatigue and horrific pain episodes. And there was no treatment at the time for this chronic condition, which now can be managed. At home for lengthy periods of time, she couldn't regularly attend Paris conservatory classes, but she got private instruction. The highest honor for a French composer in the 19th and early 20th century was the Prix de Rome, which was the reward of a five-year residency and a study grant. Nadia tried for this award several times, but then decided to focus in other areas, recognizing that her sister was even more talented than she was as a composer. So Lily set her sights on it. And in 1912, at her finalist audition, she collapsed in the middle of her performance and was then not eligible. But in 1913, she won. And what was astonishing to the world is that she was the first woman to ever receive the prize. And that made international headlines and also led to a publishing contract for her. Her health got a little better. So off she went to Rome for the residency to start her work, but World War I broke out and she had to go back to Paris where she helped form a committee to raise money to support musician soldiers. After the war, she went back to Rome, but then her health failed. So back to Paris. She was relentless about writing music. She worked on operas and some short pieces after she got back um, after the war, including the piece that the symphony is going to play at the opening of our concert. As her strength faded, her sister Nadia helped write down Lily's music. The piece that we're playing originally began as a, a work for violin and piano or flute and piano. Then she rescored it and rewrote it a little bit as a piano trio and then decided to rewrite it again and use full orchestra. So parallel three pieces with slightly different scores and all of the surviving manuscripts are in Nadia's handwriting. But this is not a deathbed piece. It's joyful. It's of a spring morning and which we can relate to. We're looking forward to that. And it's rich with vibrant energy, playful passages of stunning delicacy colorful use of instruments in the orchestra. It opens with a solo flute in the low register with rustling strings and a shimmering triangle and celeste. And there's gauzy textures as the theme is passed around the orchestra and then a big crescendo to a stunning ending. 
One of the big features is subtle dissonances throughout and lush harmonies, characteristics of Impressionism. And this was obviously a bit of an influence of Debussy, but Lily had her distinctly own voice. It's a little delightful opening to the concert and a wondrous treat from a gifted, ferociously committed composer who believed in herself and she broke a glass ceiling, believing in her talent and determined to share her music in every moment of her short life. Second on the program, our concerto highlight of the evening is Ravel's brilliant piano concerto performed by Michael Brown, who will be new to Anchorage audiences. Um, Ravel was the son of a Swiss inventor who had not very much success with his works. He invented a loop the loop roller coaster called the Whirlwind of Death, and it never caught on due to the number of fatalities associated with it. However, he did make a contribution to the two stroke internal combustion engine. The family moved to Paris when Maurice was a child, and at the age of 14, he entered the Paris Conservatory. He tried for the Prix de Rome, which Lily had won, five times and failed. It was a huge scandal on failure number five. He was 30 years old and beloved by the press and the public. And the French art world erupted in anger when he lost. And it became referred to as the Affaire Ravel and the conservatory director was forced to resign. Ravel loved attention. He was small in stature, or just barely five feet tall, and he dressed to kill in snappy suits and exotic ties. He hung out with a group of young artists and intellectuals nicknamed the Apaches, which was Paris slang for street thug. When World War I began, he was almost 40 years old and he tried to enlist in the Air Corps and was refused, but he ended up serving and drove military trucks. He was deeply haunted by young soldiers sent to die. And he wrote in a very poignant letter, if the war lasts any longer, it will be necessary to distribute baby dolls and rattles to the army. By the end of the war, Ravel had achieved considerable fame. He moved on to some interesting projects, including an opera that was surrealist in nature that includes dancing armchairs, singing teacups and flying squirrels. Love to see that production. It was, the dances in this opera were to be performed by members of Ballet Russe, headed by Serge Diaghilev, who they had worked on other projects before, but weren't friends any longer. So when Ravel encountered the impresario in a hotel lobby, Diaghilev held out his hand, but Ravel abruptly challenged him to a duel. As entertaining as it might have been to see this petite Frenchman and the suave Russian meet at dawn with pistols, friends convinced them to let the matter drop. And they did, and they both lived then. Great. In 1927, Ravel was invited to tour the United States. Prohibition was going strong and Ravel feared that he would de be deprived of his beloved French wines. Organizers of the tour assured him that all forms of liquor would be available, no problem. The dandy Frenchman awed American audiences as much with his appearance as with his piano playing. He once refused to go on stage because he had misplaced his monogrammed handkerchief. He socialized with George Gershwin, Bela Bartok, Mary Pickford, and Douglas Fairbanks. And when Gershwin took him to Harlem to hear jazz, he was recorded to be quite bewildered by the cigarettes on the table that were labeled grass. Jazz was popular in Paris in the 1920s. And just after the end of the war, black American artists were welcomed into France's cafes, concert halls, and nightclubs. At that point, Ravel's knowledge of American popular styles was pretty much through imports. But when he went on that trip to the United States, tempted by a guarantee of a $10,000 fee and a carton of his favorite cigarettes, he spent about six months in America playing concerts and traveling from New York City to the Grand Canyon. And he brought home to Paris a love for jazz. Reacting against the heroics and the bombast of many 19th century concertos, Ravel said that his new work 
was a concerto in the truest sense of the word. The music of a concerto, he said, should, in my opinion, be lighthearted and brilliant and not aim at profundity or at dramatic effects. Ravel wrote music with a lightness of touch that delights our minds and our senses. But lest one misinterpret his rejection of profundity, it bears mentioning that his music, like Mozart's, often reveals depths of feeling beneath glittering surfaces. By the end of the 20s, he was also aware of failing brain activity that would cruelly silence his last years. And he was devoting hours to playing piano etudes by Czerny and Chopin in a futile attempt at the age of 55 to become a really top rate pianist again. It wasn't until this concerto was finished late in 1931 with the premiere just a few weeks away that Ravel abandoned his aspirations of playing the premiere tour and turned to famed pianist and friend Marguerite Long to give the performances instead. The first movement starts with the crack of a whip, I'm not kidding, and then a mechanical toy-like tune in the flute and piccolo. The piano's grand entry after a warming up with arpeggios and glissandi arrives with a sultry second theme. And those two ideas make up much of the movement between jazzier episodes, lighthearted and exuberant. But the lyrical second movement is the heartbeat of the whole thing, the soul of the piece. It's one of the most poignant and beautiful pieces of music ever written, beginning with a long solo melody for the piano that is almost sounds like it was improvised. But Ravel later confessed that flowing phrase, how I worked over it bar by bar, it nearly killed me. Well, the adagio is the reason we not only delight in this concerto, but truly love it. The finale returns to the effervescent humor of the first movement, snapping back to high spirits with a brilliant romp with misplaced accents and nimble athletics by every player on the stage. Sadly, this would be one of Ravel's final, final completed works. He would fall silent after 1932, afflicted with a neurological disease that made it difficult for him to write or speak. With its refinement, understatement, and irrepressible joy, the Piano Concerto is a beautiful testament to Ravel's unique genius. Ending our French Connection grand finale with a Paris connection with all three of the composers featured at the concert, Berlioz, Hector Berlioz. He learned to love classical literature from his father, living in a small town of about 3,000 people, and the family didn't have a piano, so he studied the guitar and the flute. His destiny was to study medicine, and he moved to Paris in 1821, the medical center of the world, and shared an apartment with a cousin. Poverty without glamour reigns here, he wrote. His cousin bought a corpse for 18 francs, and they practiced dissection in a specified hospital room with, quote, rat, rats in the corner gnawing bloody vertebrae. Such horror possessed me that I leapt out of the window and fled home. But he had to persevere, and he did. He joined a claque, which is hired applauders or booers at the opera, so he got in free. And a colleague recalled that Berlioz would sing opera tunes while sawing away at the skull of the daily subject in the dissection room. He qualified as a doctor, but he still, he decided he wanted to be a musician. His dad wanted him to be a lawyer. His mom regarded musicians as abominable creatures predestined to eternal damnation. And she wrote to him, go and wallow in filth of Paris, sully your name, kill your father and me with sorrow and shame. His father relented and gave him an allowance for a short time. So Berlioz studied music and he taught himself orchestration by studying opera scores and attending opera performances. Then his dad stopped the funding. So Berlioz gave guitar lessons and sang in a vaudeville chorus and read trendy novels. Living in a garret apartment where he survived, he said on leeks, cheese, bread. He was desperate. So he wrote a mass. The premiere was a complete disaster. But then 
Enter Harriet Smithson, an actress who was in Paris to perform Shakespeare. And her Ophelia mad scene by the beautiful blue-eyed Harriet. Well, Harriet was actually a mediocre actress who compensated for a weak voice and not a lot of skills by overacting. But Paris audiences who didn't take to Shakespeare for a while kind of changed their minds with Harriet and exploded instead of pelting her with rotten veggies as they would normally have done. They loved her acting and Berlioz fell instantly in love, obsessed. Couldn't meet her though. She was way out of his league, a star. Everybody copied her hairstyles. Her lithographs were in shop windows. She performed in Romeo and Juliet. You can imagine the reaction there. Berlioz attended multiple times. Thus began, he said, the grand drama of my life. She did not respond to letters or invitations, but he noted, I hear my heartbeat and it's thudding shakes me like the vibes of a steam engine. At that time, he won second prize for the Prix de Rome. And then the next year, he won it. Very young artist and off to the residency very soon. The piece he wrote after winning the Prix de Rome at the ceremony was a total disaster. And I found it humorous to read what he said about it. 1,000 curses on musicians who do not count their measures. The damned horn missed the cue, the kettle drums hesitated, and the cymbals did nothing. Violins and basses carried on impotently. It was a fiasco. And he hurled his score at the orchestra in a rage at the end of the performance. So now let's go to Symphonie Fantastique. The year is 1830-ish. He was inspired by romantic literature, De Quincey's Confessions of an Opium Eater and a work by Victor Hugo. It appears Berlioz had experimented himself with opium. And in the tale that he contrived as kind of a basis for the symphony programmatically, was a, a composer dreams that he kills his lover and is executed. And Berlioz wrote a kind of a distilled, detailed descriptive program, which if you refer to the program notes online in the symphony program, you will find his description of the symphony at the time. He uses a concept like uh, that's described as a fixed idea, transforming a theme among the movements to tell a story. Berlioz was actually starting to do well. He was, and he was engaged to a lovely pianist named Camille with a pushy mom. Harriet was back in England, allegedly having an affair with her manager. Berlioz's family was delighted with his Roman Catholic fiance. Um, and then he went off to Rome for his, uh, begin his residency. And he got a Dear John letter from Camille saying that she was marrying someone else. In romantic style, he bought two pistols to head to Paris to do what kind of havoc we'll never know because he was stopped at the border by the police with the weapons. So he spent a month in Nice and then um, returned to Paris and Harriet was there, fate indeed. Her career was tanking. So in 1832, she attended a performance of Symphony Fantastique and she wrote Berlioz a note understanding that she was the basis of some of what had happened programmatically. Berlioz and she connected and 10 days later he wrote, I will never leave her. She is my star and she understands me. His parents were appalled. She was an actress and a Protestant and had a lot of debts. Liszt and Chopin played duets at a fundraiser for her. Berlioz became hysterical about his family, threatened suicide. So they married in 1833. They were a doomed partnership from the beginning. He was in love with her roles, not really with her. They couldn't talk to each other very much. His, her French was awful and his English was terrible. D divorce was illegal. So they parted finally in 1844. And if you wanna know more of the story, there's a little bit in the program notes in the symphony program, but any biography is great reading because there's a lot of interesting details. So back to Symphony Fantastique. Episodes in the life of an artist in five parts, written when he was 26 years old, probably the most monumental and sensational first symphony ever written by a composer in music history. 
The cyclic fixed idea I mentioned, the recurring motive, is associated with the character of the protagonist's beloved, Harriet. And that motive you will hear in all five movements as the main theme in the first movement, across a crowded ballroom in the second, distant meadows in the third, as a last vision in the famed execution scene, and then during the mockery of the witch's Sabbath and the big finale. There are also pictorial images that are color tone pictures. The heartbeat in the first statement, shepherd pipes and thunder in the country scene, the chop of the guillotine, I'm not kidding, at the end of the march to the scaffold, as well as the head falling into a basket and the hurrahs of the crowd, all illustrated musically. And then the dies irae chant for the dead in the witch's Sabbath movie, da, 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 which is a Gregorian chant that's been used in lots of classical music as a, a theme of death. But the tone colors in this whole thing are just mind blowing. My favorite description, which is anonymous, which I knew who said this, is that the symphony itself is an autobiographical masterpiece of exhibitionism and self-pity, a revolutionary temper of the age. And it established Berlioz as the father of a great line of radical orchestral composers, which would include Liszt and Wagner and Mahler, even Tchaikovsky to agree with some of the emotionalism, Saint-Saëns, and even Maurice Ravel. This work is just a gas to hear on any performance and to have it as a conclusion of our season, as a kind of a celebration that we can take on this glorious masterpiece and remind us all about the intensity of living life and experiencing every moment. Wow. What a program, and I'm so excited that you are going to be joining us either in person or live stream to experience this. So here's to our French finale and the glories of the music by Lily Boulanger, Maurice Ravel, and Hector Berlioz. And many thanks to Elizabeth Schulp, our music advisor for this season as we emerged from COVID and also still grieving the passing and celebrating the legacy of Randy Fleischer, our maestro. And um, I also wanted to bring a special thank you to someone who's in the orchestra who will be with us for the last time at, at this finale concert. And that is our concert master, Catherine Hofer. She's been concert master since the mid 1980s. So for decades, we have had the most amazing, confident, calm, dedicated leadership in that premier chair of the orchestra. Her guidance and her musicianship have just been indescribably valuable to the orchestra and to this community as a music leader, as a public school music educator, teaching orchestra, doing private lessons for generations of players, the Highland Prison Orchestra, the Society of Strings, and so many other activities. Her legacy will be felt for many, many years to come. And we are celebrating her contribution to the orchestra and wishing her well in her next chapter. We are also extremely sad to be saying goodbye to her as a member with us on the stage. So if you have the opportunity, pass your own thank yous and congratulations to Catherine for her many, many, many years of glorious music making with the symphony. We will miss her. So thank you for supporting us through COVID. And as we're emerging, stay tuned because there are gonna be other ways we're gonna symphony on that will be announced in the coming weeks and months. And we hope to bring you along with us for that musical ride. Stay safe and here's to spring. <laughs>